So I think it gets started, but if you if you need more bagels, you can pay to mark over. Um, good morning. So um, the one administrative issue, the TA is going through uh, too many issues on his personal life. So sorry. I mean, no, you don't want to know like how bad things are for him, right? So um, I'll try to take the stuff back and then and grade them. So um, I think the homework project four is delayed, and I'll try to grade them and get them to you as soon as possible, right? Uh, you should have the homework assignment solutions. I forgot to give them on on Friday. Um, so. Essentially, we are done for the class. I mean, all the stuff that is in the book that, that I want to cover for operating system was over, right? You know, we are, we are looking at operating system as a, as a mechanism to manage your your devices and stuff. So we talked about hypothetically what it would mean for processes and process synchronization and storage and memory management and security, right? So hopefully. The, that's enough for you to, you know, go on to the next more advanced level courses such as real time systems or multimedia systems, operating systems. A whole bunch of classes that we have, which go into more detail of any one of those for any particular application scenario, right? And hopefully there'll be enough for you to, when you look at architecture class or compiler class, you realize the interplay between architecture and operating system and compilers and uh, applications, right? So one of the one of the key features is. OS depends on what the architecture can give you, and on the on the other hand, architecture if it provides a feature that cannot be used by operating system, it's practically um, it's useless. Right. So you want the hardware to provide memory management facilities, and whatever it provides would make the OS work. So they they both go hand in hand. So it's not so OS and architecture pretend to work fairly close to with with, with each other. Right. So that said, I want to next kind of tie things up by looking at some of the different uh, machines that you will come across in, in real life and then figure out how you would design operating system going forward for those, right? And this is not from a textbook and this is sort of like what we'll do as, as a class. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask each one of you to kind of say your um, two cents of what you think they should be, right? So we'll start with the PDA and laptop and then move on to desktops and, and servers in next class. <coughs> The hardest stuff to do, so I'll, I'll first define what, what I think is a PDA, right? I, mean, I, I, I pull some of the images off the web. So PDA is a personal digital assistant, and um, it includes stuff like your Palm or um, Palm device or IPAX, if you had it a few years back. And now they're kind of inter getting integrated into other stuff. So if, you're, if you have a cell phone, cell phones are getting smarter, you know, there's, they're explicitly called smartphones, or even the normal phones are more smarter than they were a few years back. I mean, they're in a kind of application, all those things, right? Um, and here are some of the things I, I think is most important. So what is, so I think the most important concept of these, one of the stuff is, is expense, right? You want them to be inexpensive, you want them to be mobile, you want them to be rugged, good battery life, or, you know, be, be useful in, in all kinds of sense. Um, and the inexpensive part and the mobility part constrains what you actually squeeze in there. The processors are usually not fast. The CPU, uh, you know, is usually like maybe 200 megahertz kind of machine. Not much memory, and you have um, the storage using flash or microdrive, you know, compact flash or any number of different variants of these. Right? And this list of operating systems that you can you can buy off of them are. Symbian OS, which runs on uh, several <coughs> smartphones and stuff, and Palm, which was which is uh, big a few years back, and Microsoft Windows Mobile, QNX, some people run Linux. So that's a picture of the Linux watch from uh, IBM, right? If you can see through, it, you know, it's, it's doing a cat on the little screen, right? They've been doing this since 2000, right? So I'm not sure if, if you, you know, what that's about, but it's, it's a cool little thing to look at, right? So these things run an operating system too, right? So the, I wanna, at this point, you know, picture something. So 
How many of you have, or, or how many of you don't have any kind of devices like this with you? Like any kind of smarter or some kind of a computing device that you have in the room? You? Okay, but you, have you seen one enough to yeah. kind of sense of what, what you would want and that kind of stuff, right? Um, yeah, they, they're creeping into our life all the time, right? Um, and, and as part of the cheapness factor, they don't support many kind of stuff. They don't have a memory management unit, right? So they can't do too much, right? So in terms of processes, what would you optimize the process on this stuff to be? So what is a process on these things for people who have them or people who don't have them? Think of them. What do you do with these things? Right? How, how, many, how many things do you interact with? How do you switch? In terms of like how, imagine how you would work from your desktop. How do these things, what do you do with these things most often? Ignore, ignore what's, what's up here, right? What would what do you do with these things? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask people starting from somewhere. What do you? Mine is just a iPod, so <coughs> I play music on. Okay. So, what what else do you do while it's playing music? Right? Do you like do playlists, change stuff, or use the calendar and all those things with it? Uh, yeah, I change the playlist and stuff, but I don't use the <coughs> calendar functions or anything. Okay. okay. So if you look at it as a process, right? There's one process which is playing the song, but you can still interact with it and do other stuff, right? So it, it's it's doing a little bit of multitask, not the way you would imagine a normal scheme. Like so, you can actually play the song and look at the calendar, right? So it's doing sort of two tasks, but not in a different sense, right? So what do you do with your with a small device like that? Pretty much the same thing. What, what kind of device do you have? I have an iPod. iPod. So, and they don't have MMU, right? Which doesn't mean, which means that you cannot have virtual memory, you cannot, you cannot implement any of the more complicated stuff we, we saw in the process management uh, chapter, right? So practically whatever we learned in that section, in the two modules, don't apply here, right? Because you can't do any of the, any of the, um, sorry, the, the, the processor, the processes can't even switch to other one because there's not enough resources to run to process, right? So they do some tricks. So for example, the palm was when they switch from one process to another process, it freezes the previous process and goes to a new one, right? So if you're playing, if you're in a calendar application and then you go to another one, right? How many of you use one of these like a PDA kind of stuff? It looked like it, it's actually doing two things at the same time. So you can actually go from one, go to the other one, and then continue working and then go back, right? But essentially what it does is when you switch to application, the context switch process would save everything about the, the current process, including the screen contents and wherever you are in all the stuff, onto permanent storage, switch to the other, other application, right? And while the other application is running, this application completely stops. So it, it won't have, if you're running a clock or something, the clock will stop, everything will stop. So when you go back, it will reinitialize, roll everything up, and then and it will continue, right? For the most part, you won't notice it, because if you if you do the things right, you'll notice a slight latency, but you won't notice that the other one is completely stopped, right? Yes? Some of the newer palms actually have to place built into them as well, right? Yeah, the, the, so when you have, the other, other thing is you don't want to do so much of context, which some of the, the playing uh, songs and stuff, they use the hardware to do it. They use a speci special hardware to do it, so it, those won't be involved, right? This is sort of similar to your DMA controller kind of thing. So, so in in some sense, your your smartphone, it may not actually play the the, the, the your phone functionality may not be part of the OS at all. It may be a hardware. It may be a separate functionality which is not interrupted, right? Because if not, right? If you do everything in software. When you context switch or something, you'll notice a lag, right? So these things, main main aim in life is to play songs or or be as a phone. So people would be very annoyed if if the phone kind of cuts out while it's trying to uh, switch processes and stuff, right? So when you're so when you're playing the song, when you're doing the playlist manipulation and stuff, right? You don't want the songs to stop. So they have set. So once you start doing those kind of optimization, then the OS is, can, can gets kind of 
messy, right? The OS now has uh, something which is which it doesn't really control, kind of working together, right? And so I, 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 I moved the MMU before, right? So it doesn't have MMU, there, so you can't have virtual memory. There's only one physical memory. Um, there's only one sort of memory, right? And it's it's all good because it's it's a small device kind of thing, right? More, more to the point of storage. We, we, I, I mentioned a little bit about Flash before. Flash is, is, is one of the coolest things to come to these kind of devices, right? The, the price of Flash memory is, is uh, falling down <coughs> drastically. So most of these things have Flash. You, know, you might have seen Flash as Compact Flash, Smart Disk, or um, any number, you know, the Sony, um, whatever they call it, the, this, right? The, what is it? What is it? The, this one. The, is that XD? No, but Sony memory stick. Oh, it's Sony. Sony calls it memory stick. But whatever format, right? Like whatever little things you have, um, you can actually buy these things up to eight gigabyte on the on the little card, right? And so these are getting faster and better. So some of them can actually be used with <coughs> camera. So there's a professional camera which actually uses uh, just compact flash for storage rather than a, a DB, right? So they're getting faster and better. So the price is going down, they're getting faster. So they are, they will eventually replace hard disk, right? It may be within a year or two that your laptops will start having flash drives rather than um, hard disk, right? So the, the good things about it is it, there's no moving components, and that, that's a big plus. I mean, you don't have something worrying. So if you have a iPod, you could notice that something suddenly something is spinning inside. Right? There's a little hard disk spinning. You can still notice at some point. Right? On the other hand, the, the micro drives, they're, they're getting fairly uh, big, too. You can store a whole bunch of stuff inside. So your small iPod can store 60 gigabyte, which is still plenty. Right? But what interests us more is how do you build a file system on top of it? What kind of file system would you build on top of it, right? So if you look at the device characteristics, your micro drive is is the one we, we like the one that we studied in class. You know, it has a disk and arm and rotation and all those things. Flash, on the other hand, does not have any moving parts, so you can actually access anything serially anywhere, right? One of the bad stuff with flashes, which is which is not so bad these days, is you can only really write it a certain number of times, right? You can't rewrite it many times. Of course, the number is pretty high. I think it's like 10,000 or something, right? So you can you can only rewrite a sector 10,000 times, and after that, it it tends to go bad, right? Which no such thing exists for your hard disk, right? So what would this do to your uh, file system stuff? The the fact that you writing something. You can only write so so often before that it, it becomes permanently disabled. Yes. You want to optimize it so that you were doing using different parts of the disk, so you wouldn't have like you know a sector's like first ten seconds got written on every single file operation or file table or something. You corrupt that mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah. You you have to keep track of contacts. You have to keep them written so you don't write too many times. And that's the cache, right? Okay, so that's that's a good idea, right? One of the good ideas which which comes to your mind is you should keep track of this somewhere, somewhere, right? You should keep track of how many times you're, you're writing a sector, a block, right? So you kind of have a like a free list, some kind of a counter which keeps track of how often a page was written, right? And the OS has to keep track of this, and this cannot be rewritten, right? So this has to be around, even if you reformat the machine and everything, it has to be written, right? So the question is, where would you store it, right? The worst place to store it is on the flash itself, right? Because every time you make a modification, you're gonna write that block, right? Does that make sense? So if you if you modify something over and over again, then you're gonna get rid of it <coughs> soon. So if you keep it as a flash block, and then you try to modify it, then anytime anything modifies, you'll have to update those, right? So, and, so what would like something like a Unix inode structure uh, work out? Now well, inode structure has the, you, know, you have the, the main file block, and then you have certain direct pointers, and then two level pointers and three level pointers, 
right? You need to rethink everything. What would what what that would do with the flash, right? So, for example, if you make this file bigger, if you make the the file, if you grow the file, right? Then you have to <coughs> keep updating these pointers, right? So once you update these pointers, you either have to write it to the back, or you wait for a while and then write it back, right? If you write it back after every time you modify these pointers, at least for the direct ones and then the, and the, this one, right? Then essentially the, the write count of this is going up, right? If you wait to write it every so often, the other other part of the the picture comes in. Right? The other part of the picture is the battery part. Right? These devices, you cannot guarantee the battery will be there all the time. The battery may run out. You may pull the battery. You are just walking around all the time. Right? So the question is, do you want it to store contents without writing it to the storage? If, if so, how long would you want to store it? Right? So for people using it as a PDF or entering your uh, address book entry or something, right? Or recording, recording something. You can record audio on some of these things, right? How long would you want to wait before it's actually written, written in, right? And uh, so, what, 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 what? How long would you want to wait before it gets written into the disk? Uh, probably immediately, because you don't, I mean, unless there's a way to measure how much battery life is left. And though, so you could you could try to measure. So that's a, that's a, as as many of you who have had cell phones, you know, with those little bars and predicting, you know, based on what those bars are, right? You know that the batteries are not perfect devices. I mean, the the whole chemical process going on. Essentially, you you don't know exactly precisely when it's going to go off, right? So it kind of goes up, and there's a whole bunch of other things which are in the system, right? There's a screen, there's this whole bunch of other other things you're doing. So you can't exactly predict, right? So if you're if you tend to write too often, then this gets you. If you don't write too often, then the battery can uh, get you. So you need to kind of balance those, right? On the other hand, if you use a micro drive, then a whole bunch of other things have to be, I mean, there's a seek and all those things, right? So imagine somebody who's developing a, a, your PDA, right? Your, your small device, which can either take a flash or a compact flash, right? What hint can you give them on how they should develop their file system? You 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 had those right. You have your like your cameras. You can you, you can swap out either the flash based or the micro drive based stuff, right? If you haven't, you know, trust me, you, you could just change it on the fly, right? So, how would you develop a file system which can work with both of those such that they are aware of one or the other? The so server want to take on um, what would you optimize it for? Or what do you think they optimize it for? Nikki, you want to take it? Optimizing it so you can take it in and out a lot? Oh, no, no. Optimizing it so that I'm, I'm saying <coughs> if it's a flash memory. Then you know you have you know the, the the notion of life you know how many times you can write into the stuff comes into play. play. So you want to make sure that you don't write something over and over again, right? But on the other hand, if you're using a hard disk based system, then you know the, the constraint is the seek and other other stuff, right? So you want to keep the stuff closer together and all those things, right? So these two goals may conflict with each other, right? If you put if you so as operating system, you don't know which one could be there at any one time, right? I'm saying if you knew it's a flash. If you know it will only be flash, then you should take all this into consideration while developing your system. You shouldn't randomly keep writing something. You shouldn't like write into sector zero all the time kind of stuff. But on the other hand, if you know it's a hard disk, then you may have to write it on the same block because that will give you locality and all the other stuff, right? So when you buy a device which can either take a flash or a hard disk, what should they optimize? How would they optimize it? Right? How would they make it such that it can work for both? Should they? Uh, how do you think the typical PDA manufacturers deal with this? Uh, maybe just store things incrementally, because that would work for Flash, and it might not be horribly inefficient for drives. 
my sense is i don't think they they do anything special about that right i don't think they i, I don't think they do anything i think they just assume both are the same right um yeah you you would want to think about what you can do about this but i don't think they the other thing which gets you right these are small devices and these are inexpensive devices and these are cheap devices so they they probably don't have time to think through all the stuff right so your your pda may actually be become useless too soon because you used flash and your file system corrupted it right your pda may be too slow because it's not using the right set of stuff right what will be interesting to know is whether apple which makes the ipod with the hard disk or the flash right whether they have two different code base because they can optimize because you can't swap anything right so you can either buy a nano which comes with a flash or you can buy the regular ipod with the hard disk right so do you think that they actually make two different stuff i seriously doubt it but something that you should do right we'll see why that that becomes important when you go to the next the laptop case right but so stuff like this would would come into the picture like depending on what kind of a device you have you have to make an optimization on this on the on the system which may or may not happen right and the the, the last component we looked at was security right so what sort of security do you think that these things rely on so if you let assume that this is a small device right my it can take my calendar and all those things and they probably have more information which is more private than your desktop right i tend to keep my phone numbers and all those things in your cell phone so it probably has a lot more private information here what kind of a security do these things typically provide So some of the cell phones you can actually fine tune it, right? You can actually make it as per password for every little thing separately, right? Um, if you go through the setup menu and stuff, it let you like have a password for turning it on, making a call, accepting an incoming call, depending on what the call is and all those things, right? How many of you actually use those features? Ah, okay. You don't find them annoying? What? You don't find them annoying? No. Okay. No. So, for the rest of the class, do you find it annoying or you didn't know that they exist? All the password putting kind of takes some time, and, and you try to make calls all day, and just the password for the call, and it does kind of get annoying. <coughs> so, that, so where do you guys fall? And even if, even if you don't use it, right? Which, where do you fall <coughs> in this round? Yeah, suspect is more of people doing one or the other, right? I mean, you, you set up a lot of pa at least I set up a lot of passwords, and then found it's like really annoying when you're trying to do something and then you kind of get rid of the password, right? But on, on the most, I mean, as I don't, I rarely leave my cell phone or PDA hanging around, right? So I still trust that they are secure with me, right? Is that warranted? Is that something I should trust on? That I have this phone with me all the time, so. Phone or PDA or some of the small devices, right? How many of you use like networking stuff so these things are no longer just dumb stuff. I mean, they, they actually network and interact with others, right? They have Bluetooth and other stuff to interact, right? So they can still get viruses and other stuff from their neighbors, right? Um, we just ignore them because we just, so we choose functionality over what, what the devices can do, right? So. Hopefully you got a sense that if you're trying to design something for a PDA, right? Life is a little hard because you have to make it cheap. You have to make it cheap and you know get out the door quickly, which which essentially means that you can't have a whole bunch of features, right? You can't make it bigger. You have to make it as small as possible, as as nifty as possible. Very few users are gonna go in and say, I want a palm which which can run two tasks at the same time, right? They want a palm which has a really beautiful screen, and you can show a photo viewer or something. I mean, they want functionality or whatever, right? And at the cheapest cost. So developing operating system for for this kind of system is it's it's extremely hard, and if you go too much detail into it, it's it, you it 
tends to be a real-time system. So when you're talking about playing uh, RDO and stuff, you can have separate hardware, or at least it has to make it such that it, it has acceptable performance for what, what it has, right? So if you're playing a video on it, it should still look halfway decent, right? And this is, this is more of the focus of what you'll see in, in real-time systems course. And one of the things you'll see is it won't have this clear abstractions we talked about. You don't have a notion of a user, kernel, what, what have you. Everything is in the same thing. If you write application for those things, if you have a bug, the whole thing crashes, right? It's a really hard to develop application for those because there's no protection because you don't have the hardware to uh, fix those. So once I said all this stuff, and it looks like all the stuff we read in the class don't really apply here, right? So why why are we even talking about this, right? My last point is why do, why do we even care about these PDAs, PDAs and small devices, right? And they they're getting smarter. I mean, if you if you notice the, the newest smartphones and everything, they're getting smarter. They can do stuff that PDAs of a few years can do. I mean, you have a calendar and those kind of stuff, right? Yeah. They're also kind of, kind of merging all technologies into one whole device. Like, you have a phone with your PDA, with your iPod, and, and a camera all attached to one single machine. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, and the debate there is what, what functionality do you want to be integrated in all those things, right? Um, regardless, so, what do you choose? Do you choose one device which can do it all, or do you choose n small devices which can do each one of those? What do you think you would choose? <coughs> I don't think the answer is clear. Right? I think the companies are really fighting to figure out what that is, right? Because they, they have both, right? You can buy a uh, Motorola phone, which can do a phone and take pictures and take videos and play iPod songs, or you can buy iPod, one, one which can do iPod, one which can do camera and all those things, right? They're both existing right now. I don't know what the future is going to be. Um, it's been going on for a long time, you know. Should we merge everything into one, get rid of another one, right? There are some things I think which is obvious, like your cell phone having your, all your phone book entry. I think that makes perfect sense. I mean, I, I don't want to carry a PDA for just those, right? Because this is what you make a phone call with, right? The other ones, I'm not sure, right? So, so what's the meta, the, the meta question, right? So why do we even talk about these things? Yes. Well, we're also kind of extending the network onto the phones too, like all the data that didn't really matter if someone lost their palm. If you have a connection to a corporate mail server on your phone, that becomes important. Mm -hmm. Because then you, if someone loses the phone, then they'll suddenly find access to oh. the client. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, they are trying to be more like the next class of machines, like laptops, right? They can actually do the network, send, send stuff back and forth. Um, I mean, yeah, they, 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 they being, they're much more smarter than what I gave them credit for, right? I'm not talking about network stuff because we didn't go into the much of the networking component. But they're, they're fairly connected, they can do a whole bunch of stuff, right? But regardless of what, right, they are always going to be cheap, right? I'm not going... I don't think there's a big market for somebody who says, I bought a $3,000 laptop, I mean, PDA, right? But there's still a market for $3,000 laptop, right? But these are smaller devices. And if you say, I, I built this cool um, PDA, and this will be this big, right? Very few people want to use that, right? You want the PDA to be as small as possible, right? You want something which is like this small, and I want it to take a video and you know, show the videos of, you know, play a little video here, play songs, play, make phone calls, anything you can think of, but it has to be small, and it has to be something I can give somebody as a, uh, a Christmas gift, right? So do you, do you want somebody else to take it? So? Uh, well, what do you mean, just like, what's the... Why, why am I talking about this? I mean, it seems like it's, this is the, the, <laughs> wrong case to talk about, right? Because none of the stuff we, so if, if we start at this point, it'll look like everything we learned in this operating system class is a waste, right? The pro I mean, it's very simple, there's no need for process management, there's very little process management, there's no need for synchronization, very little need for memory management. File system is iffy at best, I mean, you know, it's whatever, right? Well, the general philosophy behind it is still the same, though, because you have all these different resources that you'll have to be utilizing for mm -hmm. different processes. And 
like you have to have some way to manage, you know, how everything's working at the same time, or mm -hmm. not necessarily at the same time, but just how to uh, mm -hmm. how to deal with everything in the process. So. Yeah, fine. I was just going to say because like, they keep getting more and more complex, then they'll probably start using some of that stuff mm -hmm. we talked about before, eventually, even if they don't. Those are two excellent points. I mean, I think they are evolving it to both those stuff, right? The other meta point is these far outnumber anything we're going to study afterwards, right? There are, I mean, I think Apple sells like what six million iPods in quarter <coughs> year, you name it, right? They sell massive amounts of uh, iPods, right? They sell like hundred million cell phones in a year or so, right? So. If you, if you think about the amount of devices that, that are in this category, they far outnumber anything you're going to see, right? As we move forward, so if they sell 100 million, let's say, PDAs in, in a quarter, they probably sell 100,000 <coughs> laptops, right? It probably keeps going down, and they probably sell like 1,000 servers or something like that, right? So, it, yeah, uh, there are all the other nice things, stuff of why we want to learn all this stuff, but. Developing for these kind of machines are very hard. You, you hope to keep all the knowledge you learn from, your, from the uh, operating system class to develop these things. But they're different beasts. Um, but you need to worry about them because they are they're so, so number, numerous and they'll they eventually have some other cooler features, right? So even like somebody mentioned like the, the newer palms can, can have a little bit of uh, uh, better management, very, very manual and stuff, right? compared to the older pumps, which are very small, right? So I'm going to next go to the laptop class, right? Laptop class, <coughs> the only distinguishing feature is it's a little bigger, right? So typically, in PDA, you don't have keyboards and stuff, but in a laptop class machines, you tend to have a key, uh, keyboard. Even though if you have one of those tablet PCs, you don't have a uh, keyboard, you just <coughs> write into those things, right? <coughs> but these are fairly little bit bigger bigger uh, class of machines, right? And they are, for, for our packing purposes, like a desktop. I mean, they have a normal processor. Um, you can put whatever processor you want in them as long as you have, you know, it, it really depends on the frying point of your lab, right? So when it reaches that point, you have to slow down, right? So if, if any of you, how many of you who have a laptop actually use it on their lab? So would you? want a faster processor on your laptop, right? Yeah, it, it burns, right? I mean, I think <laughs> some of the, you don't want to put them on top of a pillow or something and smother it, and it, actually, I think it literally burns, right? So since they're bigger, they can actually have more more components, and, and, and they can be expensive, right? I mean, they can go from anywhere from a few hundred dollars to a few thousands of dollars. People are willing to pay for them, and, and the constraint is the is a, is a heating factor, right? And whatever you can, else you can cram into those things. So you can you can buy like a two some gigahertz, and, and now all the rage is the dual core machines, right? The reasons why people <coughs> like dual core is you can you don't have to make each core run as fast. You can have two of them, and both of them can um, run slower. But you know if you have the right set of threading model, then you can still get good performance, right? So you can still be so you don't want to run a four gigahertz laptop on your lap, actually anywhere close to where, where you are. But four gigahertz, two you know dual core two gigahertz machines are to be more palatable, right? They're still pretty warm, but that that's one thing uh, you can you can deal with. They can have up to two gigabytes of memory, right? They can have a lot of memory. Um, they can have huge disks. They can you know I think you can buy up to 160 gigabytes of, of hard disk space. Um, so for all practical purposes, it's more like a desktop in terms of resources. It has a bigger screen, it has a keyboard, uh, what have you. On the other hand, it still runs off of a battery, so which is similar to your PDA. So it, it's kind of where we go from the PDA wall onto the uh, the next level, right? And all the all the all the usual suspects operating systems run on these run on these machines, right? So all the stuff we learned in the class applies here, right? So in terms of processors, right? What do you do? What 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 style of processing do you do on laptops? Do you do mostly interactive? 
remember we talked about different classes of you know interactive and batch batch oriented kind of processing server kind of processing what sort of a things do you typically do with a laptop So you you would if, if you if you develop yeah I think I think interactive tasks usually dominate these things. I mean you rarely run compute <coughs> five to the nth degree on a laptop, right? So one thing if you do that much CPU stuff, your laptop would be super hard, right? So you you're running mostly interactive kind of things. So you want to optimize it for interactive processes, right? So your process scheduling would have to worry about keyboard and updates and and how to keep the user in the loop more than and draw number crunching, right? The other stuff I, I, I didn't mention so far is, both in the PDA and the laptop, you have a notion of a suspend, right? Many of you might have used it, so you don't, so which is closely related to the notion of uh, booting performance, right? So when you turn on the machine, how soon would the machine be up and, uh, and going, right? So if you have a PDA and, and, like for example, if I have a cell phone, right, I have it turned off, <coughs> I want to turn it back on, right? What's acceptable time for you to, before it can accept your calls, before it can uh, search for cell towers and stuff, right? Minutes, seconds, uh, you know, whatever, right? And these kind of stuff, you want it to be as as uh, small as possible. You know, if you have iPod, you turn it off and you turn it back on, you want the stock to start playing within instantaneously, right? Maybe, maybe a second or so, but not for too long. So you want these things to be Boot fast, right? And you want these things to um, suspend, you know, have a way to suspend, right? Have a way to stop what it's doing and then and continue on, right? So let's look at the suspend process, right? So what what do, what do we mean by suspend? What what happens when you do a suspend? You do that with the laptop. You do do it with your your um, with the with the PDS. So you can you can turn it off where it looks like it's off, right? Okay, yeah, so the first component is you want to store everything into somewhere so you can kind of go into a go into a state where the only thing you need to look for is some event to wake you up, like maybe the power button or something, right? What's the other component? How do we how do you come come back up? Is it okay to just restore everything that you have and then move on? This may be this may be obvious to people who have tried to do suspend on older or cheaper laptops, and you might have noticed problems where the graphics card would go crazy or things won't work anymore. You come back up, your USB port doesn't work anymore, or something doesn't work anymore, kind of stuff. Right? So the idea here is when you shut everything off, when when you're doing the process and when you freeze the process, right? That's a software uh, uh, incarnation. But when you're doing a hardware sh shut off, right, when you put the hard disk into some parking mode or something, when it comes back up, right, the hard disk does not usually store state on what it was doing before. So it, it kind of essentially resets, right? So you have to spin the disk back up and bring it back to the state it was before you did something and then let it continue, right? So essentially you're doing a disk reset and then you are hoping things will come back up, right? So that those resets sometimes fail, and that's one of the things where you notice where, where the graphics card fails or whatever. So you don't so you can either do two things. You can either do a full reset or you can do a partial reset. If you do a full reset, then whatever the hardware takes is the time it takes, right? So it, it takes a long time. So you want to kind of balance that, you want to be if, if everything works good, then you can do a restore and get back the hardware quickly. If it doesn't, then your hardware can can lag, right? So frequent shut off and, and, and bring back it's not it's not very easy because you store the software state. That's that's easy. We know how to do that, right? Every process when you do a context switch, you do that. But you have to shut down your hardware. So you shut down the hardware and you bring it back. Then you have to be aware of any new hardware errors when which pop up. The other thing is, while it's, while it's shut off, you could have removed some hardware, right? So when it comes back up, 
it has to re try to restore, but the hardware itself may have may have been taken off, right? So you might have done this all the time, right? You, you have a laptop, you shut the thing off, then you take all the keyboard or USB mouse or something you had extra, when it comes back up, right? Because when it went, went to sleep, it had a USB mouse. When it comes back, it's no longer there. So it has to reset and then do all the stuff, right? So you want this the, the time for it to suspend and bring it back really, really small, right? So in the old Windows XP machine, you might have done a hibernate, but it takes like a few minutes where it says like writing something to the disk and it'll wait for a while, right? You don't want to do that because you want it to be shut off and come back, you know, come back really quickly, right? The other problem is the boot up problem, right? When I, when I start a machine, how, how quickly can it boot up? Essentially, when you, when, you, when you do a boot up, you figure out all the hardware which is in the machine, reset everything, come to a good state, know everything is working fine before you let the machine go, right? But if you do that, then if you have a lot of stuff, it can be very slow, right? So, you, so you, you have to optimize it. You have to make those things faster, right? And you might have noticed it in some some way, and there are some ways you can make it less uh, less annoying, right? One of the things that cell phones do, right? If you turn on a cell phone, what remember what happens? When you turn on a cell phone. What is the first thing which 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 what it does? It'll first put a logo, right? It'll put a, put a logo, probably some song or something, and say something about welcome or something, some some cutesy little thing which I've never seen anyone who looks at this and goes like, wow, Montreal, right? <laughs> you, you, you know those things, right? Something comes up, right? And then you'll ask for a password or something, it'll search for something, right? So if you look at that, they do a lot of work, they do a lot of research to see how it affects people, right? When I, when I ask you how long does it take for you to turn on a cell phone, do you answer the time between when you press the button and when you can make a phone call, which is what you really care, Right? or when it starts to say, searching for a cell tower, right? Or when you turn on the cell phone and the, the stupid song comes on, right? <laughs> what, what, would you, what would you call as the, as the time the machine is up? It's but what, what, do, what is the impression that people get when they turn it on, right? They, but when they see something, people assume that something is happening, right? Um, and th this sounds like a strange thing, but they do a lot of work to, like, they, they put some of these things to make, make it look like something is happening, right? If they have a blank screen where nothing happens, and suddenly everything is working, say, so you can now make a phone call, you're gonna think they are waiting for a long time. But while they have all these dis little distractions that make the people uh, feel, feel happy about it, right? So. There are, this, these are these are one one way to do that. A lot of the like the newer um, cameras, like you know, if, you, if, you, if you get a camera and turn it on, right, it'll take a while to boot up and everything. So some of them do optimistic uh, reboot, right? When they boot up, they assume that everything is working fine. They let you take pictures. Most of the time it's fine, but they're doing all the research and all in the background, right? So uh, after they did all the research, if, if you, so you, you're allowed to take a picture, I think within 0.8 seconds or so after you boot up. Not put up. If you turn the switch on, you can take pictures, right? And then they have, then they kind of it, it figures out. I mean, the real reboot happens, and then it will start write the pictures. Right? So there's a small window of opportunity where it takes a picture and finds out there's something wrong with the hardware. But it kind of it, only in those cases your picture won't be there. But other other cases it will go, right? And you're gonna have to see a lot of those when you when you go into the laptops because. What you really want to do with the memory, if you have memory, is like you have to check to make sure all the memory is, is there. So if you have two gigabyte of memory, it's gonna take you a long time. And that goes back into the, the, the suspense. If I, if I have two gigabytes of main memory, and I wanna suspend, I gotta figure out what to do with the whole memory. I have to write it to a hard disk or what have you. That takes time. And booting up takes time. Everything takes time, right? So how do you add more resources and still make the reboot instantaneous, right? And that's that's a raging thing. And if you if you read some of the literature, people are trying to make the laptops boot almost instantaneously rather than waiting for a while. Right? Has anyone read some article on how you would reboot your laptop quickly? Can okay, you think of? Yeah. Uh, I read something about parallel boot up on it. Maybe it's just mm -hmm. boot up to multiple 
processes and hopefully find that. Yeah, you, you try to boot every hardware <coughs> in parallel, yeah. but then you have a lot of dependencies, you know, like some things may fail, but for the most part, you're kind of good, right? If you run off Windows XP or you know, Longhorn, you could take like a gig cache and a hard drive and then just save the core and boot data in there, and then you could boot a lot faster than mechanical. And that, that's one of the reasons why that the, most of the newer machines are going, right? Essentially, when you boot the machine, it figures out all the modules that you needed last time, right, on the fly. Then it kind of writes something onto disk or actually non-volatile RAM or some memory technology, right? Where it knows all the stuff that was needed to boot your particular machine with your particular setup and stores it somewhere. So when you boot it next time, it can directly take it from there, right? In fact, Windows XP is supposed to do that, right? Like the first time you reboot the machine, it's slow. After that, it, it, it becomes better and better. And this, this goes beyond that, right? So essentially, you, you store a uh, uh, image of what your machine was after it rebooted, store it somewhere, and every time you come back, you are right there, right? Of course, if this thing is corrupted, then you're host, because then you can't, you can't come back, right? So there are, there are, there are these things to consider. So there, there are issues of, you know, what if the user wants to suspend, what, how do I do this stuff? Um, so th regarding the process, um, I'm, I'm going to stop after this pretty topic. So, re regarding processes, right? You know, they 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 do multimedia stuff. You know, people watch DVD movies and all those things on, on, on these devices. So, when you schedule processes, is there anything different that you'll do knowing that there's, there's this notion of suspense and all those things? Do you schedule processes based on whatever things you looked at in LRU or what what have you? Or would you schedule some processes differently depending on where you are? Regard okay, without worrying about what typical operating systems do, right? How many of you used a laptop and you had so so you know, the, you know, how many of you were using a laptop and suddenly you say, oh, I wish it was not doing that. I mean I wish it'll stop that so I can do something else, right? You open up the thing and it's 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 going about doing something. It's it's trying to bring up the DVD movie that you're watching just before you shut it off, and all you're trying to do is check your email, right? And when you bring it back up, it, it's trying to bring the DVD movie and everything, while you know you, you're gonna only open the laptop for a second, send some email, and, and then close it up, right? How many of you have faced that kind of issue, right? So the, the idea here is, if I only open, want to open my laptop for a second, right, I don't want it to do the right thing by bringing back everything that I had before and wait for me to come back, right? So being able to kind of say, yes, you, 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 you probably want that process, but it's going to take me a while to bring it back up. So some of the processes won't even be there, right? Would be a nice thing that you would want to see. So essentially, you open it up. Some of the processes are frozen, and those may not never bring them back because it thinks that you're going to go away soon, either because your battery is running low or what have you, right? The, the, most annoying thing I find in Windows XP model is when your battery is running really, really low, and you, you're trying to squeeze the last bit of work out, and it's trying to do the hibernate like right for a for a while. You can't interrupt that the thing, and if it if it crashed halfway through, you know your host, but there's nothing you can do. And when you turn it back on, it'll get the whole stuff back, right? So those sort of stuff, it's not useful. So you want some kind of control where it says, I'll let you open and and check email. Nothing more, right? Nothing. Everything else means I need to bring some back from the desk, and I'm not going to do that, right? You will have to see some, some of those in the in the oh, in the future. So, it does the same process scheduling, but it has to figure out interactive task versus the background task and try to do something like that. And we'll continue with a little bit of this in the next <coughs> class, more to the other class machines, right? And feel free to take whatever uh, legally you want. Just,